Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining me again today, listeners. With us is Linda Fodrini Johnson. She's got a book called The Empowered Caregiver, and we have decided to talk about what to do when you're encountering resistance how to set limits, and how to share the caregiving load, which we're hoping to also include siblings that don't always agree with us, because as you know, I had one of those. So thanks for joining me, Linda. Great to be here. Awesome. So why don't we start with your background and how, why you wrote the book and what you're doing to support caregivers okay. on an ongoing basis, and then we'll jump into the topics. My background is extensive. Um, <laughs> I started the very first Alzheimer respite program in the um, probably in the San Francisco Bay Area. It was only three hours twice a week, and people couldn't even say the word Alzheimer's back in 1984. Um, <laughs> That's so the year I, I graduated from high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, anyway, I was working on my master's degree at the time in clinical psychology. So during the time I ran that program, I, uh, of course, graduated, got my hours, got my license, and I'm a family therapist, plus being a certified geriatric care manager, very active in the Aging Life Care Association, and I'm a past president of that national association. I had a business for 30 years called Elder Care Services. I had 200 employees, geriatric care managers, home care workers, and we did a lot of family education and support groups, and that's my favorite. So after selling my business and semi-retiring, that's what I continue. Wrote the book because I didn't want to retire and leave all my knowledge with me. I wanted to share it with the public. That's the only reason I wrote the book. I really, you don't make a whole lot of money when you write a book. So it wasn't, because it's not fun to write a book. It's like writing one college paper after another <laughs> and putting them together and then making them understandable. Um, anyway, so um, that's what I'm doing now. I do support groups. I do a Zoom class uh, every month. I do... Um, some counseling and, and some family, I call them roadmaps. I help families uh, have a map for now and the future. So that had somebody just um, describe instead of care plan. Oh, fudge. Now I'm going to forget what she called it, but it was like a survival guide. That's what she called it. And I'm like, that's better than care plan. And I like that's, roadmap too. I don't like yeah. care plan because. No, that's too clinical. Roadmap is good. Yeah. You have a roadmap so that you. you you, you can avoid needing a survival guide. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. Or you know where to get it if you do take one of those dips, you know, in which uh, no matter how sophisticated, well-trained and educated you are, if you're working with your family, you're back to being 10 year old. I hate yeah. to tell you that, but <laughs> sometimes when your parents don't listen to anything you say and you have resistance, which we're going to talk about, they're thinking that you're still their child. Mm -hmm. Actually, Jennifer, there's a research base researched on the um, daughter-in-law or son-in-law could have more success suggesting something to your parent than you because your parents didn't know them as a child. They only met them when they were an adult. So they see them as an adult and they don't see you as an adult. You have a PhD, uh, you're an <laughs> MD, doesn't matter. You're still 10 uh, when that's, you get resistance. That's, that's interesting because my husband had so much more success with my mom. Part of it, I think, was personality. Part of it, I think, is what you just mentioned. But he was always so much better. He had like more patience. He just, he seemed to be able to speak her language better. And it, oh, it was wonderful because obviously both mom and I benefited from his, his dealing with her in a better way than I did. I'm sure that's very good grammar, but it's also really frustrating because it's like, why are you better at this than me? <laughs> and and now you can see because you are seen as a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That makes sense. And yeah. it wasn't like she actually acted like that, but I bet you there was some subconscious stuff going on. So that's really helpful to know because it gets really hard. And I've seen people taking care of grandparents that seem to have a better relationship, better caregiving journey. And I think it's because they're, I mean, obviously they were kids. They're still kind of kids compared to a grandparent, but there's just something different with, I've always said taking care of a parent is harder than anything else. I totally agree. And there's something called filial maturity. And that means that you're the two adults see each other as adults, not as parent child or a child that needs to parent their parent. That's when you're going to get conflict. But when you see each other as equal adults, you're going to have more success. Filial maturity doesn't happen in many families. Or we no. be writing books and doing support groups. <laughs> yeah. We, I, know I keep saying, you know, it's okay if we find a cure for this disease and and put me quote unquote out of business. You know? But I don't still, know what I would. I don't know what I'd do with myself if I didn't have at least this project to work on on a regular basis. Well, there's other care issues because lives don't go on forever, and families are going to be pulled into it uh, no matter what's going on because it's end of life and people need support. So, but let's back up to resistance, you know, Jennifer, because. I think sometimes you get resistance because of the approach. And if you do have the opportunity to read my book, I hope you all do. And I know, Jennifer, you did. Um, but uh, I know from my kids telling each other, read mom's books, page six. And on, <laughs> in mom's book, page six, it says, don't tell your aging parent any shoulds. If you're concerned about it, you say, mom, I'm concerned you lost weight recently instead of you really should eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and not just one meal a day, mom, you really need to do that because your blood took blah, 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 blah. They've turned you off as soon as you turn, use the word should. So for all yeah, of us. You can us, stop talking after the word should. <laughs> should. Yeah. It's like, oh, sorry about that. I'm concerned. Even if you hear yourself, you can stop and, and turn it around. Um, and you're going to have a little bit more success. It doesn't mean you're not going to have resistance, but you have more opportunity for success. Um, and, and I think the the other part of resistance is it it is part of um, our brain uh, and our brain that's affected by the dementia is the ability, uh, the inability to understand and process information. So us adult children, we come on with all kinds of suggestions and ideas and we overwhelm our parents often. And so you get no to everything. <laughs> and so you have to remember, it's not just because your mother or father is being obstinate. It actually is part of the process of the brain involvement uh, resisting uh, because they can't understand. Yeah. It would have been very helpful to know I had, I did it right, but I had a situation where, and people have heard this story a lot. My, we had a family business together. Mom had started taking orders from clients with no directions or due dates or anything useful. And she would always do it the, the day before her day off, which I don't know if there was a real, you know, relationship to being tired or whatever, but it was in the beginning, it was really easy to dismiss because she was 52 and a half, you know, something that somebody came in the door, the phone rang, whatever, really easy to dismiss, but it started happening more. And one day she did not recognize her own handwriting on an order that had zero clues as to what we were supposed to do with it. And I told her, and I used the exact word. I said, mom, I'm starting to get a little concerned. You used to have these daffy moments you now a couple times a week. Now you're having them a couple times a day. And also, the listeners probably should remember that my grandmother had vascular dementia. So this is my mom's mom. And my mom looked at me and she goes, well, I don't want to end up like my mother. Stomped her foot and turned around and huffed out of the room. And I thought, well, murder is illegal. So I don't know what the hell you think I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and it was so frustrating because it, from, it was literally like hitting a wall. I mean, like, what am I supposed to do? You don't want to acknowledge there's a problem. I can't help you but there's a problem and you need help. And 
it's just for a long time, I thought she was just being obstinate because obstinate is sort of a family trait. <laughs> But I've learned, and you've reiterated, that it is part of our brain and it is part of the disease. So do you have any suggestions of what I should have done in that situation other than shrug my shoulders and just go back to work? Well, you know, I do a lot of coaching with families. And I might say, I mean, I might give you some script. And the script I might give you was, you know, it used to happen once a week or twice a week, mom, and now it's happening all the time. And then she says, I don't want to be like my mother. And I said, I don't either, but there's new research and we can get you tested. And it might be something like a, a in your diet that we can change. It could be something that would enhance your memory and help you concentrate better. So let's just do that. So again, it's helping her be successful and respecting her dignity, but not denying her fear. I had a mother with vascular dementia too, and I've had my genetic genes done and I could go the same route if I don't follow you know, a good healthy lifestyle. So again, there's, there are um, options to make life better. And what we want is quality of life, mom. Um, I don't want you to go down grandma's path either. You just this join was- them. I call it joining them. Yeah, which would be a lot easier now. This was about 20 years ago. Yeah. So this was between 2000 and 2005. So we we know a lot more. At that point, it was like, uh, <laughs> it's going to happen. So I don't know what you want me to do. Exactly. So now, exactly. But it helps, you know, like, even that answer, had I had that, might have helped. Because my parents' nutritional intake was terrible. Because my dad was a terrible eater. A lot of processed foods. My mom drank two two liters of Diet Coke a day. Ooh. Yeah. Sometimes caffeine-free. She didn't even give herself that benefit. And they they just, a lot of just not high-quality food. I think yeah. about what they ate, and it makes me queasy. So <laughs> I know. And I see older people eating some of that food, too. And I went, oh, my God, what's it doing to their brain? Um, and, and again, if you have some genetic uh, predisposition to this journey, and most of you that are listening to Jennifer's podcast probably are. And so we want to take care of ourselves. So as we deal with these issues, we need to think about our own long lives and what we want them to be. Um, But resistance, um, again, support groups are great. Jennifer, I'm glad you do one. I do a few myself. Um, When you hear what other people have done for some resistance, it gives you ideas too. Um, In my little do's and don'ts on communicating with people with dementia, um, like I'll share it with you, Jennifer, and you could share it with any of your audience that want it as well. But it's like, I used to have something that I called stretching the truth and now we call it therapeutic fiblets Mm -hmm. and it's, it's to protect self-esteem and reduce stress. That's the only time we use those things. And maybe the response I gave you about giving your mom hope uh, is a therapeutic fiblet. Maybe she's already on that path. She probably was by the time (laughs) you saw it happening many times in a day and there was no reversing it, uh, probably. Um, maybe we could have plateaued her for a little while, but we might not have reversed it. Um, so again, using a fiblet to, to get something accomplished sometimes works as well, especially when <laughs> adult children always want their parent to make the decision about moving to retirement living, right? Yep. And when you have dementia, choices are difficult. Remember, that's part of the disease process. You cannot make choices. So adult children, you go out there, you find the two you like, two, two places. You show mom or dad, but you say that's for the future. It's not for now. You you can't move there now. I just want to know if you break a hip or something, We're going to go for something medical, right? Understandable. If you broke break your hip and needed some care, which place you would like? So we don't have to make that decision. It's your decision. You like Happy Hills because they have a resident dog. They have a swimming pool. But you don't like um, Green Valley because you didn't like the size of the library. You you know, (laughs) whatever it is. I mean. So you, you kind of introduce the subject 
And then if the disease progresses to a point where mom or dad is not safe, that's when you're going to have to play the therapeutic flip fiblet card and come up with a reason. Uh, sometimes the physician could be part of that, must, live, must have 24-hour care, but many people I'm working with a family right now and the mom says, no way, I'm never going to any one of those places. But if the, the plumbing has to be redone in your whole community, so everybody on your street has to move out for three months while they're redoing the plumbing, that works. And then mom or dad moves into, you know, Happy Valley <laughs> trails or whatever it is. <laughs> happy trails. Uh, happy trails, <laughs> right. There we go. Um, and uh, they move in and the three months gets renewed and renewed and renewed, you know, they're not done with the plumbing yet. Remember, people will settle in depending on where they are with the dementia. They'll ask to go home, they'll ask about that, the plumbing, um, but it will stop at some point, most, most of the time. Yeah, when um, we move mom to memory care, I, my dad never allowed my sister and I to help, which you know, I'm sure he was trying to protect us, but it wasn't, wasn't beneficial. So he assumed she'd come live with me. I knew that was no way in hell that was happening. And I was 50 and I still had my other business. So yeah, I was like, no, th thanks for that conversation that never happened. But she, for the first six weeks, acted like um, a prisoner of war being released every time I came. It was so traumatic. There was one day myself, my daughter, and my paternal grandmother all went to visit her and she cried and shrieked and carried on so bad. My daughter and my grandmother never went back. They spent time with my mom, but they did not go back to the care home. It was horrible. And a story I tell all the time, you know, I showed up one day, my mom was walking down the hall behind another resident who was bound and determined to use the phone. I need to use the phone. Where are the yellow pages? Where's the phone book? It was just, which always cracked me up because, you know, this was 2017. We don't use phone books really anymore. And my mom spotted me and she goes, oh, come with me. I have to help my friend. And when I heard that word friend, it took every ounce of strength not to burst into tears of joy. You would have thought somebody handed me the publisher's clearinghouse check, the winning lotto check and a bag of diamonds. It was just like, and yes. she never, I never had any of that. I got to go home. You know, the kids are waiting for me. None of that. I was so blessed with that point, but man, those first six weeks were hell. So <laughs> yeah. And I think that's pretty common, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and many facilities and many geriatric care managers like myself will sometimes tell a family, I don't want you to go visit the first week. I want you to send a paid caregiver. I want you to send a nephew or somebody your mother's not going to recognize to go and sit and observe her and give you the feedback how she's doing. And that's then a good, you. That's a good way to do it. I talked to a previous guest. I can't remember which episode it was. So it's it's around the same time as yours is coming out, I think. And when they, she moved her mom to a care home, they told her she couldn't come for a week. And then it was like, yeah, no, I better make it two. And then two went by, I eh, better do another week. So like three weeks, she was not allowed to see her mom, which I don't know how she managed that because that would have been hard. <laughs> the trauma and, I, and the screaming and crying was not great, but just quote unquote, abandoning my mom for three weeks would have not been great either. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I suggest if there's a caregiver that's been working with the, the parent, that that caregiver go, but take the, the parent to the activity and then move themselves back. So there's not dependency on the person she's sitting next to. So she connects with another resident, the friend that's got to find the yellow pages yeah. <laughs> or the guy that wants to whatever, go to work. It's time to go to work. You know, she wants to help him get ready for work. Um, let that happen and don't interfere, but be there to make sure when they feel lost, they, they get redirected into whatever the activity is happening. Um, and, and that works. That's worked a lot for lots of clients I've worked with in the past. That makes um, yeah, sense. Observer instead of the, it is traumatic for both parties. You feel guilty like you did it, but it really is the disease process did it. You know, mom was confident she'd be in her own home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah.
And that one, the other thing I point out is that my mom had friends in memory care. She wouldn't have had those ladies if she'd been with me. She would have had a par- paid caregiver in the evening and, you know, my husband or a paid caregiver during the day and my husband and I, and I don't know what the hell else we would have done. Cause I also had my sister to deal with. And as most of my listeners know, my sister and I never agreed on anything <laughs> ever. <laughs> we did yeah. do, we did okay for the first couple of years after dad died. And then, you know, just her life and my life are so different that, you know, we used to check in, she'd visit mom and check in with me and say what happened and vice versa. And then it just got to the point where it was so repetitive. It was like, why am I telling you? It's like, saw mom today, ditto last week. You know, it was like, eh. You know, I I wish we had been cognizant enough of why it would have still been helpful to check in, even if the information was the same all the the time, but live and learn. (laughs) Yeah, you do your best with the information, the tools you have at the time, right? You can't Mm -hmm. beat yourself up of what you should have done, could have done, you know, that's being in the moment. And, and then when you're visiting too, you're just in the moment. You're not in the, you don't go backwards and don't go forwards. Just be in the moment. That's true. Um, that, that one was hard for me. Learning to just be in her reality yes. was always really challenging. I got much better at it, but it was right at the end, which was unfortunate. I mean, at least I did learn it, but still it was, it, it's really hard. It's not as easy as, you know, the little memes on social media make it sound. It no, really it is, is difficult. No. But we were talking about resistance. And I'm going to, um, I did not prepare her for this. So hopefully we can, it's not too big a curveball, but a lot of people, me included, you know, we have that they resist taking a shower. They don't think they need one. They think they just took one. I've talked to past guests about, you know, using, um, you know, rinseless bathing cloths that you can get. Or one gal suggested that as their cognitive abilities revert back to more basic abilities, as like very similar to younger children, that a bath is not necessarily a bad idea. So do you have any suggestions for people on how to help the the bathing resistance? Because that can get really ugly smelling. (laughs) Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. I started using a product that all you caregivers need to try. I started taking AG1 from Athletic Greens after my workouts because I needed a quick and healthy way to refuel my body. While there are lots of options, most don't taste great, and I don't eat or drink things that don't taste good. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious, mildly tropical flavored scoop, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins and minerals whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to fuel you for your crazy day ahead. AG1 helps support mental clarity throughout the day and you know how important brain health is to this gal. It has over 7,000 five-star reviews and costs less than $3 a day. And you know your time is worth more than three bucks. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. I'm sure you're aware that there may be a connection between poor gut health and dementia, so this is another way to help protect your brain. As caregivers to someone with a cognitive impairment, this is also an excellent way to get much needed nutrition into someone who is slowly losing the ability to eat. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D, which is also important for brain health, and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash emerging to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to our conversation. Yeah. I, yeah. Again, sometimes it's making sure it's not you, the family member doing it. Somebody comes in dressed like a nurse's aide. It's doctor sent me here to give you a shower um, and make sure that you respect their dignity and their their privates are covered until it's time to wash that part of their body. Um, 
the water is the right temperature. The, the reason people don't, because you can't do the dials anymore. You ever go to a hotel and wonder how you could make that shower work? <laughs> yes. Well, I that, hate that. Happens, that happens to people with dementia every single day. So they're not taking a shower because they can't figure it out. So there, there's a lot of stuff to this resistance. And, and people say they don't like water over them. Yeah, because they don't know how to get out of it or what to do. They need support. So um, many agencies, this is a long time ago, had bath aid services that you could hire somebody for two hours that would do the bath, change the sheets, get them into clean clothes, and the family member doesn't have to do it. Uh, one of the guys, the husbands in one of my support groups said, every time I try to give her a shower, she thinks I want to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> so he had to hire a female nurse's aide to give her about a shower and that worked. So it's being um, a detective and trying different things and figuring out what is the fear of this? And yeah, I remember my mother-in-law telling us that she took a, a shower every day and we were at her house and there was cobwebs in the bathtub. Oh, oh no, that's a, so that's that, a clue. That, that wasn't, she was not, and she didn't smell, but I think she was giving herself a sponge bath. And I think it was fear that she would fall. She was not com, uh, cognitively challenged too much. She was frail and she needed support, but didn't want it. So there is resistance from, from other things as well um, that we want to do it on our own, no matter what. Um, but there's the awareness that you might fall and slip in that tub or that shower too. So again, I think being a detective, figuring it out, talking to somebody else, um, Medicare, if you ask the doctor, um, because there's been a change, a change of condition sometimes is the trigger to get Medicare, especially if the person is homebound, to get uh, Medicare home care services and bathing assistance with learning how to bathe the person. So then you can get it covered by Medicare. So again, then somebody that's doing it all the time, they have lots of tricks that they've used with different people. Um, people that have movement disorders, there's little chairs that it's not just something you sit in. It's almost like a wheelchair and it's safe. It's netted and water goes through it, but the person's not going to fall over. And the and they can even do it themselves once they're in a safe setting and the water has been set for them. They might be able to clean themselves uh, just fine. So finding the right tools and the right approach is going to be different for everybody. But Jennifer, you're right. It's common. I don't want to yeah. take a shower. I don't want to take a bath. And another approach is, would you like to take a shower now and let them say no? And then ask them what time they would like to take it. And you come back in 30 minutes, especially somebody that is, has a memory impairment. And you say, this is the time you wanted your shower. I've got the room all nice and warm. And I've got your favorite robe in there. And look at this good smelling lavender soap. And off you go. Um, but again, uh, using another person sometimes has been the, the answer for uh, a lot of families I've worked with. Well, it gives the, the caregiver, the family member, a little break to do anything else besides wrestle with somebody in the shower, which is not fun. But you were saying that with um, through the doctor, you might be able to get a change of status diagnosis. And you meant you said they come in and train you. So it's not, it's can not you hire just somebody? Getting, you can hire somebody too, but I'm trying to get Medicare to cover it, right? Okay. But so that, I that doesn't last forever? No. The nurse okay. comes in and she's going to tell you how to the approach. Sometimes that works. And sometimes you want a break, like the gentleman in my support group, that his wife was getting the wrong idea. <laughs> she didn't have any clothes on and he's rubbing her and, you know, she wanted to have fun. And uh, he didn't, he wanted to get the job done, uh, especially then. Um, and yeah. That makes sense. So be creative and, and use all the resources that are open to you, um, like having somebody come in and train you because you might... You might need a, a new technique. And in using those rinseless towel things, uh, you know, 
I don't know how to use one unless somebody told me how to use it. And how do you approach the person with dementia with it? And how do they understand what it is and what they're doing? You know, I would like to see somebody do it and then I can do it. Right? That makes sense. I tried, a, um, tried a particular brand, their sponsor, excuse me. I'm not sure why I'm so burpy today. Um, and you basically wet it and just rub it all over your body. I did it on our bicycle trip because, you know, you're, <laughs> you're riding your bike every single day. So it's like, how much showering and hair washing do I want to do? I'm just going to get gross tomorrow. So when you were going to a restaurant, you could either take a quick rinse in the shower. Now I, you know, I'm in here in California where I'm sure people have recently heard that Los Angeles County gets about a thimble full of water a day. That's not fun. So, I mean, I've made the joke that, you know, I'm in California. I'm not going to be allowed to take showers anymore soon. <laughs> the climate change situation doesn't get fixed. And they're, they were actually really nice. They're soft. They smelled nice. They didn't leave any kind of weird residue that made you want to, like, go shower it off. They were They were nice. So if you're out there riding on a, you know, summer morning with your friends and you stop at the pizza and beer joint, which is what our cycle group likes to do, you know, you could go in and use the restroom Squirt some water on one of these towels, wipe the areas that need the most wiping, and then you're not grossing out the server. So, you know, it's not just for people that resist taking showers. It's for people who need a little refresh or, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, you go to the gym on your lunch break and might be an option. I don't know. I don't go to gyms anymore and I haven't worked in an office in over 17 years. So <laughs> I've worked from home. If I want a shower, I could take a shower. <laughs> But many of your listeners probably are working and running off to take care of mom or dad after their job. And maybe then they have a theater ticket that night too. So what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, it's just, it's nice to have options. And I have talked, one of my past guests has FTD and other health issues and the water hitting her skin. And I, I had read that this was probable with older adults with memory issues or cognitive issues. And, but she confirmed that the water hitting the skin feels like needles hitting her skin. And they had their bathroom redone, you know, like the grants that come in to redo your um, bathrooms or particular parts of your home for safety, health safety kind of thing. Huh? And she loved it for the first like week. But if you walk into a shower, it is pretty much all one color. Not so there. It's almost like a sensory deprivation box, and then the water psh, hits you right in the head. Right. So it's actually if your you know your brain doesn't process things the way ours hopefully does, you know the shower is not necessarily a real pleasant place to go spend time. No, no, and you know bathtubs are kind of dangerous to get in and out of. There are those bathtubs that have the door, you know, for people that are disabled or afraid of getting in and out of bathtubs that you can use but even then you're going to get resistance so you know don't re totally remodel and think yeah. the resistance <laughs> will go away when you after you pay twenty thousand dollars to have you know top of the line uh equipment put in there yeah you might have to hose them off in the yard <laughs> right <laughs> and when you was threatened to do that to her father-in-law because i guess he's just stunk to high heaven that's not fun. So no, and and, uh, and that's again when you can um, enlist the physician, and this is what's going on. It becomes a health issue, especially that's helpful to know. Enlist the physician. I I don't generally lean towards discussing this stuff with the medical professionals, just because my moms were not very helpful. You know, we she ended up with a new general um, practitioner at the end stages and he didn't know what to do with her. And he was a very nice person. I'm sure he was very knowledgeable, but it was like, I can't fix her. I can't cure her. I don't know why you're here. It was the vibe I got every time we were there and it just irritated me. I always had to remind the staff she had advanced Alzheimer's. I'm like, you're the one with her medical chart. I even told the gal, like the office manager, like, could you just put a big label on the front or on the front inside? You know, it, I know there's HIPAA laws, or I think that's the HIPAA laws. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we, you don't have to, you know, put a, put the label on her forehead, but you know, I'm really tired of having to remind you people that no, I cannot, she cannot collect urine for possible UTI. And we've done this the same way the last three times. Could we just 
could I not have to retrain you guys every time? So I don't lean that way towards asking the medical professionals for help because they weren't very helpful for me. They That's where me you great. have to be specific what you ask for and why. That's and make, good advice. Make it a medical reason. And if the doctor's not responsive, find another one. And if you can find a geriatrician, find a geriatrician. Yeah, that's been advice I've heard a lot. Or functional probably... medicine specialist also. Not that they're experts in dementia, but they look for the why, not just treating what's presented. Functional medicine. Okay. Because yeah. I kind of, I get assigned to a doctor and I don't think she ever has time for me. So I'd kind of like to switch, but... I'd rather just to avoid it altogether. So functional medicine, I will do that. Yeah. So now, so we, we've talked about resistance. resistance and we, but we're, we keep bumping up against asking for help. So how do we, in, you know, well, we kind of glossed over setting limits. Let's go well, to getting fine. help. You know, well, let's think- talk about how to incorporate help in beneficial ways that maybe don't break the bank and then we could set limits. Okay. <laughs> Well, help means sharing the care. Don't be the only one. Number one, if you are the only one, you got to enlist a team. And it might be other family members. And it might be outside people that you hire. It could be volunteers. It could be Stephen ministers uh, that are free from churches. Um, It could be uh, we have peer counseling in our county. It could be one of those kind of people. So there's a whole lot of resources out there that can help you share the care. Because if you're an adult daughter or adult son and you're trying to make it perfect for mom or dad, especially if they have dementia, you're gonna burn out. I guarantee you, you will burn out. And just Google burnout and you'll see all the symptoms. You're not sleeping, you're not eating, or you're overeating. You're no longer exercising. You're not seeing your friends. You're not giving your spouse or partner the attention they want, and they're complaining about it. You don't have time to shop for yourself. You don't have time for your kids. Um, That's too much. You know, you need to share the care. And And sometimes you have siblings like Jennifer has a sibling that, you know, wasn't the greatest partner in in sharing the care for mom. And I have three younger brothers. And when my mom needed care, I'm going to give you a little uh, something called the fur method. And so the fur method is the letter fur or the letters for F-I-R-R. And the first F stands for the facts. And the facts are my mom has to take a blood thinner every night and she's so she doesn't have more of these little strokes. And so I'm calling her every night. I'm running a company with 200 employees, right? I'm tired. I have a husband. I have grandkids. I have, you know, community things I like to be involved in. And I can't because every night at seven o'clock, I have to call my mom to remind her to take the medicine. But mom wants to tell me about the senior center, about what they served, about her cat. And it's like, oh, just take the pink pill, mom, you know? (laughs) And so the fact is, so the first F is the fact, and I'm talking to my brother now, Gary. And the fact is, Gary, mom needs to take this pill every single night. And the I in fur is the impact on you. And this is really impacting my life. I can't, I don't have evenings free. I need you to help call mom at least three nights a week. Could you do Monday, Wednesday, Friday? I know you can't drive her. Could you take pain medications? That's the respect. So the the, the, the next R, the, the R, I guess there's two R's in fur, the, um, is the respect. You must say something respectful about that person's life that you're going to ask. And then the final R is the result you want. The result back going back to can you call mom three nights a week? So if you've said the respect part, the, I understand, you know, you have pain medication, you can't drive her and there's a lot going on in your life, but can you do this? And he said, sure. So I got three nights off and then I had two other brothers that I could (laughs) enlist. (laughs) 
<laughs> and they lived farther away. This brother lived the closest to my mom. So that's what I did. And he wasn't able to help in many other ways, but he could help there. So again, enlisting somebody else. And when I do a family meeting, I give everybody in the family some job. You take care of mom's finances. You take care of mom's uh upkeep on her home, you take mom to medical appointments, and you get mom to church on Sundays. So everybody in the, the family's got a job. Uh, and not that one sibling. Um, when Jennifer, when I do a family meeting, I ask everybody who they're most concerned about. I don't let anybody comment. I, I say, who are you most concerned about? And what do you want to see happen? Right? And so they all go around and say, I'm most concerned about mom. I'm most concerned about grandma. I'm most concerned about Uncle Jim. And they tell you why. If you move grandpa, then grandma can't see him. She takes a little bus to his nursing home every day. And if you move him to your home, she won't be able to see grandpa every day. So if everybody answers those questions honestly and nobody comments, the person that asked me to come usually has an answer to what needs to be done without me giving it to them. So who sense. you're most concerned about is not always that person with dementia. It's that daughter that's over caring. This one family that had three kids, a husband and, and the daughter's brother. So there was a lot of people in that meeting. They, the majority of them were concerned about her. <laughs> mom. And mom wants to bring grandpa home to live in their home because she didn't like the nursing home. At the end, she turned to me and said, can you help us make it better in the nursing home? I said, yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so again, you need to know what everybody is most concerned about. You guys aren't on the same page often. And what you want to see happen at that meeting also, when I'm doing a meeting, I want to know what each person is expecting because <laughs> if you don't ask, they're not going to get it, you know? It's really important. Uh, and you can have these meetings without a professional if your family's um, fairly mentally healthy. Just knowing that one tip is really beneficial and it ties in really well with a podcaster and his mom that I interviewed way back early in, the, early in my podcasting days. They actually came together as a family to support mom and her siblings who are supporting dad who'd been taking care of their mom and he threw up the white flag and said, I can't do this anymore. Please find, you know, you go do the research on a care home and then, you know, he'll swoop in at the last minute and kind of decide. And the way they all came together, they actually wanted to like incorporate it legally because grandma had Alzheimer's and while they were caring for her as an entire care team, the whole like extended family, her sister ended up with Alzheimer's and she'd never been married and did not have children. So she didn't have a built in care team. And so this family expanded their care committee and took care of this great aunt, aunt, whatever generation we were discussing. But what they did was they asked everybody you know, what do you feel comfortable doing? And I've taken that and twisted it. So if you know, you, you know, you need help, or you're in the early, early stages of a diagnosis, and you've listened to me and other people like Linda, and you, you know, everybody's like, you're going to need help, you're going to need help. What I suggest for getting help is, you know, make a list of all your daily activities, your daily chores, your weekly chores, monthly chores, all the stuff that's all the stuff that's required to maintain your life, your home, your, your loved one, and then a list of everybody you know. They do not have to live in the same city as you and what you think their best skill is. Mm -hmm. And then when somebody says, oh, my gosh, I've heard about your loved one. I'm so sorry. Is there anything I could do to help? You have a built-in answer, and your answer will not overwhelm them. It kind of goes with the fur thing you said, you know. Mm -hmm. It was you know, bad, yeah. Yeah. Cause if you ask me to do certain things, the answer is going to be, Oh God, no, I'm terrible at that. Yeah. But if you want me to bake or cook or some other stuff, gotcha. I can, I can do a couple meals a week for you, especially cause my husband does all the cooking now ever since the pandemic, I can't wrestle dinner back away from him even a couple nights a week. So 
I, I would give me a, kid, a reason to kick him out of the kitchen. <laughs> but, you know, huh. it's, it's, it's in how we think about it. If, if somebody's supporting you, the caregiver, it gives you more time to take care of your loved one, but it also gets them acclimated to people coming in the home and doing things or people doing things for you. And then it's not such a trauma when they're further into the disease and need a lot more help. And now all of a sudden you got this person in the, you know, the scrubs coming in to manhandle them into the shower. Hopefully they're not manhandling them, but you know, that's, that's kind of what happens is we try to do it all ourselves for so long. And then we bring in help and man, they throw up the brakes, the brick wall at every other barrier they can think of to prevent that. So it's definitely the other thing that happened, Jennifer, um, with some families is uh, again, here you're gonna hear the therapist part of me. <laughs> that parent might have never appreciated or thanked you or said, I love you. And an adult child, mostly adult daughters, tries so hard to be the perfect daughter to get mom to finally say, I love you. And it can happen with dementia. One of the things that happens is that person with dementia kind of likes you now so they <laughs> didn't they were critical of you for the last 55 years and all of a sudden they smile when they see you and it feels good so you don't let anybody else do it because now mom likes you but you're burning out because there's a lot to do so that's a little bit of the only one syndrome how did you get caught into being the only one? Because you've been looking for mom to say, I love you all your life. And now she does. So you don't want to let it go because you were looking for that. So, you know, finding a balance in life, you know, this Jennifer, you know, you're a bicyclist, you exercise, you, you're willing to cook. You're willing <laughs> to do something outside of what you do all the time for yourself. That's how we age better by taking care of ourselves. Yeah. I'm trying. My paternal grandmother lived to see her 103rd birthday. She was. She said the day that we buried my dad, who was her oldest son, that she was striving to be 105. And I think had she allowed my aunt, who was the daughter-in-law, to bring in outside help, my grandmother had plenty of money. My grandmother could have had Cadillac care in her home. But she refused. She said, family dis for family. Well, she burned out my aunt. She pissed off my dad. And she just made it hard for everybody, including herself. So she might have made it to 105 if she had listened to people like you. And just, you know, she was always afraid of being ripped off, which was a legitimate concern. It because is. she was it is. she was mostly blind from glaucoma. And she was obviously a significantly older adult. And she lived alone. And she was female. So, you know, <laughs> she had a lot of the the risk factors for getting ripped off. And, right. you know, if you can't see if a contractor is properly repairing your roof, which even that would be a challenge for me because I'm not climbing on the roof to check on their work. I'd have to trust them. You know, it's, right. you, it's, it's easy. But my point was, is that, you know, she just, she resisted. You know, my dad made some good points when my daughter was in college. He said, she needs work. You need help. Fran is done. Um, you know, this is what an in-home caregiver would make. This is the stuff that I, th my dad was very precise. My dad was an engineer, so he was very specific. You know, he researched, you know, um, the salary, the duties. And he said, you need light housekeeping. You need somebody to prepare basic meals and somebody to drive you around. You know, my aunt had agreed to do specific things, but no longer other things because essentially my grandmother sucked up her entire life. You know, with doctor's appointments and hair appointments, you know, it was like three or four times a week. The woman had to be driven somewhere. Yeah. So, but no, my grandmother refused. She refused to accept the help, pay for the help, didn't care. It was just, ugh. So she did not make it to 105, but she did pretty good up to 102. Or three or two. Yeah. Wow. Well, she got to 103, but she, the last nine months of her life, she had to be in board and care because she was... She was so frail, she couldn't get to the bathroom easily on her own. And, you know, sometimes when the urge hits and you can't, like, dash to the bathroom, you're in trouble. Right. And I, she was starting, I think, having uh, many strokes. So, mm -hmm. um, and she got really hard of hearing, which I don't know how you deal with not being able to see very well and not being able to hear very well. That's it's like 
really a challenge. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's where trust is really hard and a lot of fear. And mm. I was really stunned at how, how well she accepted being at a board and care. I figured, cause my aunt, well, my, my grandmother ended up in the hospital shortly after mother's day of 2020. Like the last couple of years have been whew, a lot. And I, and then they were saying, well, we're going to send her to, um, um, shoot. Uh, it was like a, a rehab facility. And I knew which one they were sending her to. It was in my old hometown. I was like, Oh, that's not going to be good. Yeah. My aunt was like, this place is terrible. We're putting her in a board and care home. And I, that was July of 2020. I'm like, I literally told my husband, I must go see my grandmother. I haven't seen her since mother's day. I got into the garage, into the, you know, got in my car, turned the key, <laughs> the car didn't start because I didn't drive enough during the pandemic. Oh gosh. So I had to drive to the Honda dealership and get a new battery. Then I had to go see my grandmother, but I was convinced like this woman wanted to live in her home till she died. Now she's in a boarding care, you know, with these Filipino ladies taking care of her and, you know, anybody that's lived with an older adult that hits a hundred, they've got some, some beliefs and attitudes that we don't always accept anymore. And so I was like, Oh, this is it. She'll be lucky if she gets to labor day and she made it to her 103rd birthday. So I was surprised, man, that woman had some serious resilience. <laughs> I will say the caregivers in lots of these small boarding cares are loving and attentive and everybody is grandma and her mom. Um, they're just really, my mother was in one the last six months of her life and I couldn't have asked for anything better for the end of her life. Um, the care was just so gentle and respectful. Very yeah, nice. they were great. My grandmother had no complaints except for about the food. I think they're, I don't know. They didn't cook what she liked to eat very well. So, you know, but you know, if that's their only complaint, I don't really care for the food that much. I think that's saying a lot. And, and the fact that she lived in March, you know, almost 10 months in a board and care home for a lady that was 102 and wanted to die in her own home. That's saying, that's saying some good things about this place. And they let family in during the pandemic. Cause like I said, this was 2020. We had to wear masks, which was really hard because you had to scream at my grandmother to be able to heard. And then right. she liked to have some, some of those end of life conversations where she wanted to make sure your soul was going to be fine. Oh, <laughs> it was like, wow. let me scream my answers at you so everybody can hear it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Nothing personal about this answer is there. <laughs> It was crazy. So we're getting really long, but this has been very good. Thank you. How can we set up boundaries and limits? Where there was just a brief, not brief, but there was a conversation yesterday on Instagram about how we're perceived as the villain when we, when we say no, when we set up boundaries. How can we overcome the feeling that that's, that's a bad thing? Number one, get in a support group so you have somebody you can talk to about it, okay? And, and having boundaries with yourself and saying no is healthy. And, and mm -hmm. it feels selfish. So then you feel guilty, right? Yep. This is selfish. I said no. I'm a bad whatever I am relative of some sort. Um, and then I feel guilty. And then I go again. And I do what they wanted me to do. I didn't send any boundary because I felt bad. Setting boundaries, just like you do with children and teenagers and everything, is really good for them. It makes people re respect. And again, it's really hard for those with dementia. But remember, their timeline is kind of warped. And they don't know mm -hmm. if tomorrow is tomorrow or tomorrow is a week ago or a week past. Mm -hmm. So when you say, Mom, I'll see you, I'll see you soon, not tomorrow, I'll see you soon. Um, and if things get bad, I remember telling one of my counseling clients and her mother raged at her from the time she was in a board and care of the mom, from the time the daughter walked in, she was an only child as well. So she had no siblings to share the, the burden with share, the mother share that joy <laughs> raged at her. And I told her, I said, you tell your mother, this is limit setting that if she starts screaming, you're going to leave. And as soon as she starts screaming, you leave. 
and and just tell me i want you to tell me every visit how long before she started screaming the first time it was like three minutes after the daughter said that <laughs> she started screaming the daughter left the next visit it was actually 10 minutes before the mother started screaming at her and finally they got to 30 minute visits without the mother screaming and the daughter learned to leave mom i have a dentist appointment i've got to run mom i have to pick up the kids there's always a reason why they had to leave not that the mother had so setting limits you can do it and change behavior by setting your limits uh now that's somebody that it was cognitively with it but definitely had a personality problem and was physically very frail and angry at the world for her frailty you know it, everyone else was at fault for why she was <laughs> who she was it was she wasn't taking responsibility but what i want to say about that is when you set limits it's always going to feel bad at first you're going to feel bad about yourself but it's really good about the relationship is saying you know you stormed out of here sister or brother when we were talking about mom or dad because you didn't like what i had to share can we agree that we're going to spend 30 minutes and if we don't agree with somebody we're going to still sit there and either um tell each other what we don't respect or what we don't agree with and we'll agree to disagree we're going to agree that we can leave this conversation disagreeing and it's okay so you kind of set the 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 stage so to speak so there it, it's it's kind of limit setting or at least it is preventing um unspoken conflict which is worse it's heavy when you yeah, have that and it's in your gut you're going to think about it day and night and you're not going to be able to sleep but if you said we agree not to agree okay we agree not to agree you're a republican i'm a democrat i'm an independent <laughs> or whatever the, the things are that people agree and disagree about um you you know so i, I think setting limits means respecting yourself and respecting the other person too and when people are needy we're talking about people who are very needy mm -hmm. and and people who feel safe sometimes when we're there and don't feel safe when we leave we can't be there 24 7 so we have to take care of ourselves. if we have a heart attack or stroke we can't oversee mom or dad and let me tell yep. you, I've been doing this for so long. I've had client caregiver children have strokes, have aneurysms, die of heart attacks before their Oof. parent. Ugh. Ugh. Okay. I, I know the I know the statistic that um sixty-five percent of caregivers are hospitalized or die before the person they're caregiving for. But holy Toledo, I never put that into con context with, you know a generation younger taking care of, you know, like me taking care of my mom. Holy, ugh, that's yes. gruesome. But yes. your agree to disagree would have probably really helped my sister and I, because I think there was always that underlying tension that we'd created for ourselves, or I'm mostly speaking to myself about myself, but I think I'm assuming she probably felt the same way is that, you know, I, don't like this. I don't like what she's suggesting, but you know, she's going to want me to agree with her or, or you know, she's, or flip the coin. You're like, I know she's never going to agree with this, even though this is the best reason, you know, you almost, I think we set ourselves up to constantly disagree. You know which, what I've seen happen, Jennifer, when families mm -hmm. do that, finally do it, they're coming to compromise. You know, they don't, I don't even talk about that in the beginning. I don't talk about it with them, but they'll come back if they're, somebody that I've been working with. And they said, well, I didn't agree with her way and she didn't agree with my way, but what we we decided to do was this, it's something in the middle. And so well, compromise good. comes out of that. Well, that's good too, because you've tried three different things. And it, when you find a in the middle solution, it's not your way or my way, it's the way. It is the so, way. That would have helped my sister and I a lot too. Yeah. Well, this has been Awesome. I think people are gonna have to listen to this two or three times, which okay. will not hurt our feelings because we have just given them tons of good information. The book, The Empowered Caregiver is linked in the show notes. If you're watching the YouTube video, she just showed it. 
Um, it is very good. It is super easy read. Many people know that one of the reasons I started the podcast is because despite being a reader, I just found some of these books to just be so heavy and so hard to get through. Yes. Not that the information wasn't good, but her chapters are so short and so to the point that you just keep going. <laughs> yeah, I, I write the issue, the strategy, and a resource maybe, and an affirmation on every chapter. Mm -hmm. Yep. The affirmations are very nice. So I might share some of those on social media when this episode comes out. Great. So I want to thank Linda for the book and this wonderful conversation. Thank you. Jennifer. And thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.